Hey, all you wonderful VIP members. Uh, you guys submitted a whole bunch of questions for me, which is amazing. And I'm gonna try and answer at least one question from everybody who asked one. So I'm gonna go right in, here we go. Okay, so Kyle asks, if you could only visit one wine region for the rest of your life, what would it be? Uh, I think it would be Greece, if, if that counts as a region. I know it's a country, but they make wine. Uh, the wine is, there's some great wines to be found. It's not like amazing from a wine perspective, but I want to go to Greece very, very often. It was the greatest trip I ever took. I think the people are amazing. The food's amazing. The landscape and the culture is amazing. Um, if you made me pick it just based on wine, I might say the Loire Valley because it's a really, really diverse wine region and has some of my favorite wines that have like ever been made. So the Loire Valley in France, plus it's France. I love France in general. I love French food and, and French cuisine as well and culture. I would also consider maybe Southern California, like Santa Barbara, again, wines that I like. And I just, I like, you know, California has a lot to offer, places to go, things to do, great food scenes. So those would probably be my top three, but I haven't been to Tuscany. I haven't been to Burgundy. So I haven't been to all of them yet. So it's hard to make that distinction. All right, Steve asks, some of you kind of, Steve Rankin asks, maybe an overview of the winemaking process, harvest, crust, fermentation. So some of you actually gave me video ideas, which I also appreciate. Uh, and that seems more like a video idea. But what I will say is that I am planning on doing a harvest episode one day. It's just really hard logistically because to get the full harvest from start to finish, I would really need to be there multiple times. So it needs to be a wine region that's close to me. I probably should have done it when I was back in California because now I'm in Illinois and there's just less options here to do that. Um, Cause you want to show start to finish. So I'd have to go multiple times. So I am going to do an episode on that eventually. Um, if I don't do an episode at the very least, it'll be like a segment on it. Deb Olson asks, what, upcom what upcoming locales for visiting and filming do you have in mind? Sneaky peeky like, yeah, <laughs> she wants uh, the sneak peeks. Uh, yeah, so I'm pitching right now. We filmed for this new season, Southern Rhone and Virginia. I am pitching Chile and I am pitching Lebanon and I'm really hoping those will come through. Uh, I'm really pitching South Africa. I don't think that's gonna come through. I just am having trouble getting that put together. Um, and I have a couple other ones that'll maybe happen late next year. Like I'm talking to Germany and I think Germany needs to happen. So those are the ones I have coming up. Renee asks, are there groups of regions that you think have enough similarity in the varietals that can help hedge your bets on finding a new region you may enjoy? For example, if you love Malbec from Argentina or Pinot Noir from Oregon, what are other regions that have similar characteristics? Well, number one, I'd say go by climate and part of the world before you go by grape because two grapes made in two different places can be wildly different. Uh, everybody knows the famous example is Pinot Noir from Burgundy is nothing like Pinot Noir from Russian River, California. So go by climate, number one. Number two, Wine Folly actually on her website, if you search a grape or if you get the book, she has similar grapes listed. So that's a really good resource for that. Um, and number three, yeah, she do like a nerd lab on that or maybe some sort of segment on that. So that's a good call. Kim Donnelly asks, how did I get into wine? Uh, I got into wine because I was trying to be a musician, singer songwriter. I think a lot of you kind of know this story, but I was trying to be a singer songwriter in Los Angeles. And while I was doing that, I was paying the way with bars and restaurants. Uh, and I fell in love with wine there. And then I had some mentors who got me into it more and wanted me to take the exam. And so then I took the certified sommelier exam. Uh, but I guess I really got into it because I went to Europe in college and I was fascinated by it. I was just like, oh, this is a cool thing that is kind of exclusive and there's knowledge and you can dive deep and learn a lot. And so that was probably the, the real catalyst. And my dad, my dad, I was around wine as a kid because my dad worked as a wine importer for a period of time. Uh, Darlene Clausen says, are you planning to visit any other states this season? I know you guys really like me doing domestic episodes and it's not that I don't want to do domestic episodes, but I also really want to do all these other places. Um, and so I probably won't do another domestic episode for season five. I will eventually do Michigan and Texas. Those are the next two. I know a lot of people want me to do Temecula, but I've done a lot of California. Um, I really want to do a different state. So Michigan and Texas are the next two domestic episodes we'll do. But since we did Virginia for season five, this will probably be for season six. 
Uh, Wayne asks, what has been your biggest challenge in producing wine videos and how have you overcome it? Yeah, just when I started, uh, man, it was it's just a lot. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys know, we're independent. I do a lot of the work myself and I have a very small crew. Um, and like the, to do what we do for a Netflix or something like that, we literally, I'm not exaggerating, take a budget about 10 times ours. So it's been challenging to get the funding to do what we do and to do it at the level of quality that you guys are used to with our small team. As we grow, I'm really hoping I can get some help, but that's been that's been the hardest challenge in producing this for sure. Uh, funny, it hasn't been like talking to people or being on camera or even distributing, although that's been tough too. Um, and also the business side of it that's just, you know, accounting and figuring out how to monetize was really hard. Um, that was also really challenging. Uh, Tim Champness asks, how should I organize my cellar? I have approximately 250 bottles with room for 500 for long and short term storage. Reds only. Ugh. You're asking the wrong guy. I've never had a, <laughs> I, I have a, some wines and they're all just stacked on top of each other sideways, but they're stacked. I don't have a big enough fridge for all of them because I'm, I still haven't bought a permanent place where I've decided what size fridge I want. So I'm putting that off. My gut would say, my gut would say Google somebody smarter than me about this because this is like a whole art form topic. I should probably learn about it. But my gut would say by region, that's, and then I would label them by price so you know, and then by vintage. So I'd organize them by region. I would put the price on them so you know, you know, if it's a Tuesday night wine or a special wine. And then I would make sure you know, organize them by vintage within the region so you know what needs to be used first. That's my guess, but I'm sure Google has lots of better answers than that. Vince Perez asks, ever consider doing an episode on the history of wine in a particular region you visited? Yeah, I'm gonna do, if I do the history of wine, it probably has to be in like Georgia. I think that's where most people can agree that wine started. Although I don't know, I think, I'd have to look into it. I think there's like, places in China that have had really, really old wine. But I think Georgia is kind of commonly known as the place that started wine. But Wes, when I first did something with him, and it's on my channel, if you search the history of wine on my YouTube channel, he did a thing about the history of wine. And he just like did it freelance. Like he, we didn't cut, we didn't plan it. He just talked for like 10 minutes. And it's actually viewed a lot on YouTube. And that's a really good way to learn about that. Laura W asks, have you ever had a problem with your recording equipment while traveling? For example, a camera not charging well in a country on different voltages in the US and how'd you overcome it? You know, surprisingly, I guess we have had a gear equipment. You know what the number one gear equipment we have is though? It's nothing about the travel, it's things fail. So like for instance, and you won't know what it is. So for instance, we used to record with a lav going into a recorder that then went into the camera. And so in between those, you've got all these cables. There's like five cables that need to happen to connect all those and all sorts of levels and stuff. And sometimes like you'll, the microphone will just be going in our monitors and we have to stop for like an hour to figure out what is the problem. Um, or for instance, the other day we were filming in Virginia and the LAVs, the wireless signal was giving like a in the camera and we couldn't figure out why. We had we Googled, we had stopped for an hour and eventually we figured out, I think, because the European signals that are in the air are different from the American signals and, and the frequencies interfere. So we have some problems like that, I guess, or just like a failure that we can't figure out why. Um, but luckily, I think from an equipment standpoint, we've been pretty good. We have lost a drone. That is the other thing that happened one time. Uh, we've lost a drone um, to a tree, I think. So that did happen and that's, it's not uncommon though. Drone pilots will tell you like drones tend to get lost every couple years. It's just what happens. All right, um, Deb Dwindle asks, what was your all time favorite moment filming? Man, there's a lot of them. And obviously you guys saw the 1800s port that I had in the port episode. That was a really special moment. Dinner in Mexico was a really special moment. You guys see, I got a little emotional at the end of that. If you remember the Mexico episode, that was a good moment. But another one that actually gets kind of under the radar is the first time we turned the camera on. And I can tell you when that is. It's in the Santa Barbara episode. 
and it's when I, I interview with Wes. That's the first time I ever did anything like this. For, you know, that was the first time we hit go for Vida Trevino, and that just is kind of a special moment, right? Uh, and you can see I'm nervous. I don't really know how to conduct myself, and the quality's kind of bad. The background's blown out. But that whole episode, I was just kind of like in the, in my, in the kitchen when I do the cooking segment, I'm like really like free and having fun because I didn't like know anything. I was in my head about like, I need to make sure I get a good performance from me, from the person I'm interviewing. What's the crew doing? We've got five cameras going. Are they all in sync? Blah, blah, blah. I didn't have to worry about any of that. I was just going. And so there's like a freedom to that first episode that's kind of fun. Parveen Hughes asks, easy decoding tips for picking up wine in a store. You obviously haven't seen our Chicago episode. I have a, I also put a separate video too of how to buy wine and definitely, definitely, definitely look at it. I literally do a 10 steps to buying wine in a store. So it's the how to buy wine episode or how to buy wine segments on our YouTube channel or it's in the middle of the Chicago episode. Uh, Marianne Donnelly asks, how do you feel about listing wine ingredients on labels? Given the lawsuit that's happening about this, do you think any progress will be made? Yeah, I think it's ridiculous that you don't have to put what's in the wine on the label. It leads to a lot of crappy garbage wine with a lot of additives that they would never add if they had to disclose it. Um, and it's like liquor is the only thing that's like that in America. Everything else, think about it, any food you buy, they have to list what's in it. But liquor has, the liquor lobbyists have this hold on everything and they can protect it and they don't have to put anything. You literally don't have to put what's in your alcohol or your wine or at all. Um, and so it's pretty wild. And so I hope that more people start willingly do this, support the places that willingly do that, and be wary of any sub $10 wines, uh, at least American made sub $10 wines where we don't have the laws like Europe does um, to protect against gross additives being put in your wine because there definitely is some. Jason Clopton asks, can you describe typical tastes of different varietals, i.e. cherry and raspberry, green veg, stewed versus ripe versus unripe, etc.? I think we that's kind of what we do in our episodes a little bit when we talk about the grapes, right? I say these are the typical flavors associated with these wines. I also did a tasting video, how to taste in Chicago, where we talk a little bit about that stewed versus ripe versus unripe. Also in the aging video that I did in Piedmont, where I talk about how wine ages, I talk about when wines, you know, when flavors go from fresh to dried and, and things like that. Um, so that's kind of a thing that I, I hope we cover as you watch more and more episodes. I thought about this question a little more, and I think what you might be asking is, how do you pick out these flavors in wines? Obviously, like, cherry tastes like cherry, but how do you find that in a wine, right? The two things I would say is start getting used to smelling everything. So, like, when you go to the grocery store, smell everything. When you go to a flower shop, smell it all. Don't be afraid to smell everything and start training your nose that way. That's number one. And number two, repetition, repetition. Uh, the more you smell a Pinot Noir that has cherry notes in it based on its description that they wrote, just like remember that. And the next time you smell that, you'd be like, oh yeah, that's cherry. So those are my tips for that. Rick and Ann Ellis says, do you have any pets? I do. She's my number one editing partner. I have a little tuxedo cat named Gilly and I love her more than anything, and I kind of have a little bit of a bummer news which over the last few weeks she hasn't been doing well, and she's kind of on the, the last couple of weeks of life here. She's had a good life with us, but she's been my number one editing partner. She stays up with me till 2 a.m., sits on my lap and helps me edit, um, and so she's, yeah, she's awesome. I'll put a little photo of her. Alex J says, when you're at a restaurant and having a starter, shared apps, and entree, how do you go about picking a wine that can suit all courses? Alex, great question. Uh, light red or heavy whites, those are your things. So, but, but with acid, both acid, acidity is what you need. You need acidity. So, w here's a couple options. One, you can do a bottle of champagne that has acidity, but champagne's kind of like, and it pairs with almost everything. But champagne's very specific. You have to like kind of want champagne, right? So what I would do is if there's enough people and you think you'll drink two bottles, you know, six people, you'll drink two bottles, get a bottle of red burgundy and a bottle of white burgundy. If you have a good bottle of red burgundy, which is a high acid Chardonnay, and a good bottle of red burgundy, which is a high acid Pinot Noir, you'll be able to pair almost every single thing on the planet. Um, but if you don't want to do that, like if you don't want those specific grapes, like I said, high acid, grapes. Um, 
But I like fuller, the thing about high acid whites is that like, I don't really like light whites. I want a heavy high acid white. And that usually means a good like Chenin Blanc or Chardonnay or good um, white Rhone blend for a white. And then for a red, a light red, a Gamay or a Pinot Noir, um, but not a California big rich Pinot Noir. Like it has to be lean. Um, so that's what I would say. If you have to get one, probably champagne. That's, that's what I'd say. Um, or, you know, that's also the good uh, thing about a buy the glass list. If it's a solid buy the glass list and everybody can get wines that, that pair. Uh, and that's it, I hit at least one response to everybody who asked a question. So thank you guys for asking. I hope this kind of was a fun VIP video, a little different. Uh, if you guys like it, tell me in the comments uh, and then I will maybe do this again. We'll do another round of questions or I'll answer some of these that I didn't get to this time. Uh, thank you guys, see you soon.